So we're going to talk about nematodes here. Nematodes are classified with plant pathogens. So nemat means thread, ode means like, so thread-like. They're obligate parasites, which means they have to have something to feed on in order to exist. They're very small, 300 to 1,000 micrometers. And they're vermiform or worm-like. They're long and slender. And they're non-segmented round worms. They're eel-shaped. So only 10% of nematodes are plant parasites. Most plant parasitic nematodes are soil-borne, but a few will actually feed upon uh, shoots and uh, upper portions of plants. So many of them are very positive in the soil. They eat disease-causing organisms. They're a food source for soil-building organisms. They can change soil components into nutrients. In other words, nutrients such as nitrogen or phosphorus are stored in the bodies of bacteria, fungi, and other organisms, and then they're released when the nematodes eat and digest them. The bacteria and fungi contain more nutrients than the nematodes need, so any excess is going to be released into the soil in a form that plants can use. They regulate numbers of soil organisms, and you can purchase them to manage larvae in the soil, such as root weevil larvae or crane fly larvae. And here's your general uh, typical life cycle of a plant parasitic nematode. So here's some examples of some mouth parts. We're not so concerned with the one on the right, the bacteriovore mouth part. That's feeding on bacteria. Herbivores are what we're looking at, and you can see there's this little needle-like thing called the stylet that comes out of the nematode. And here's what it looks like under a microscope. So there's different types. Uh, migratory ectoparasites. These feed from the outside of the roots. They pierce cells in roots without entering the roots. And they may attack a root, one root, in several places. They don't uh, necessarily stay in one place. So an example of that is a dagger nematode. And in the upper portion here in this photo is a rose. And on the right, we've got healthy roots. On the left, we've got dagger nematode infested roots, which you can see are not healthy at all. And then at the bottom here, we've got Xiphonema index gall on grape roots. So then we have sedentary ectoparasites. They tunnel partially into the roots. What they do is they their head enters the root for permanent feeding and the bodies remain on the outside. But once they do find a feeding site, they don't move. And thankfully we don't have this particular nematode. This is a citrus nematode and it's found in California. So migratory endoparasites, that's on the inside. They feed on the inside of the roots, they tunnel inside, then move back into the soil to infect new roots. So they go in and out. And one example of this is root lesion nematodes, which this is a picture of. So here's a root lesion nematode on corn roots. And then we got sedentary endoparasites. They tunnel into the roots, set up permanent feeding sites. They don't move. They may, may swell from the roots as they grow, and the two most common are going to be the root knot nematodes and the cyst nematodes. So root knot nematode uh, is on the right here. So on the left we've got a lettuce cultivar salinus that is resistant to root knot nematode. On the right we've got uh, Ithaca, which is susceptible. So you can see we've got healthy roots on the left, and then we've got these nodules or galls on the right. And then there's foliar nematodes. And there's over 200 host species for this, strawberry, hosta, fern, begonia, chrysanthemum, dahlia, phlox, etc. And you can see here we've got it on hosta. So some of the symptoms you'll see are water-soaked lesions, and of course we know about that when we're thinking about bacteria, right? Um, so on 
die cots, they look at angular leaf spots, and then on monocots, they'll, the lesions will often run parallel to the leaf veins. So foliar nematodes feed on the inside of leaves, and of course, you're probably thinking, you know, they look a, a lot like leaf miners, and that's true. Um, you would have to know the plant, and you might need to have it tested to confirm. Usually, with leaf miners, though, if you hold something up to the light, you can see larva inside. So they reproduce inside the leaf. Each female lays about 30 eggs. They hatch and begin to reproduce at about 10 to 14 days. So the tissue becomes necrotic or dies back. It dries out, leaving this large, large dead patch of tissue, and you may see a yellow halo, which is kind of faint on here, but you do see that on echinacea. Okay, this is a leaf of a day lily that's infected. If the tissue dries out, some stages of the nematode can become dormant, and while they're dormant, they're very difficult to kill. They can remain viable for over a year, and they will just resume their life cycle when water becomes available. So general management, uh, you want to remove infected leaves that can help reduce the spread, but once a plant has nematodes, it's very hard to get rid of. It's best to remove and destroy all plants that show any symptoms of infection. So survival and spread, anything that moves soil, equipment, tools, shoes, birds, insect, dust, wind, water, uh, movement of nematode, infested plants or plant parts, and then of course weed hosts and volunteer plants that may have had it last year. So you need to send it into a lab to have it diagnosed and they're able to tell what it is by the type of stylet, the tail, the surface of the cuticle, and then they do a count of how many are in there. So not a lot of uh, great ways to manage this. Avoidance, just make sure you're uh, providing all the things that plants need. Exclusion, you want to quarantine the plants before you mix it up with other things. Eradication would be sanitation. You might try a heat treatment or a chemical. You rogue out infected plants, remove weed hosts, do crop rotations, and then you can use plant compounds to kill or repel. And if you look on Canvas, I've put in a couple of resources for that. The, the important thing to know is, and it's marigolds, and the right, you have to pick the right marigold for the right nematode. So you need to make sure you know which one you have. And it's not a matter of just interplanting with marigolds. You're going to need to do a cover crop of marigolds to really be able to manage these guys or repel them. And finally, protection. There's some things that are genetically resistant. Some of them are tolerant. You want to irrigate to the roots and not overhead because you can spread it through water. And then, as I just mentioned, nematode suppressive plants.